Right now on Morning News Now, decision day. This morning, voters in five states heading to the polls for primary elections as President Biden and former President Trump look ahead to November. Our basic freedoms are under assault. Freedom to vote, freedom to choose, and so much more. My predecessor and his allies in Congress make no apologies for it. And in Battleground, Ohio, a critical test for Mr. Trump and the GOP in a Senate race that could shift the balance of power in Washington. We'll break down the races and what is at stake. Meanwhile, more legal fallout for Donald Trump over his $464 million judgment in his civil fraud case. Why Trump's lawyers now say securing the money is a, quote, practical impossibility. Also, former Trump aide Peter Navarro set to start serving prison time over a congressional subpoena after the Supreme Court rejected a last-ditch appeal. We'll bring you the latest. And an important conversation that could save lives, why more young people are getting diagnosed with colon cancer and what you can do to stay healthy. Plus, early bloomers. Today might be the official first day of spring, but for many of us looking outside, the season might have started weeks ago. We will get to the root of it all and what it means as we look ahead to summer, there is some good news for you. Good morning. I'm Savannah Sellers. Joe's off this morning. This morning, we're going to get started with these voters there in Florida, Arizona, Illinois, Ohio, Kansas. They are all headed to the polls to cast their ballots in their state's primaries. And while the candidates for the White House are all but decided, their presence will be looming large in some down-ballot races, perhaps Nowhere more so than Ohio, where former President Donald Trump and the state's GOP establishment will clash in the battle to take on Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown in November. For more, we're joined by NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray. Mark, as always, great to see you. Thanks for being here. So help us break down this Ohio Senate primary. What do we need to know about the candidates and what are you going to be watching out for today? Yes, yeah, Savannah, that's, this is tonight's marquee primary contest in what, what could end up being one of the marquee Senate matchups in the fall. And this is the Republicans' opportunity to take on Sherrod Brown. Uh, and the top candidates are Bernie Moreno, who's been endorsed by Donald Trump, Matt Dolan, who has the endorsement from Governor Mike DeWine and a lot of the Republican establishment, as well as Secretary of State Frank LaRose. And uh, the polling ends up showing, and it's not a whole lot of great polling in this contest, but a very, very close and competitive race, particularly between uh, uh, Dolan, uh, who I said ended up getting the endorsement of Mike DeWine, and Bernie Moreno, who has the endorsement from Donald Trump. Mark, Ohio's become this increasingly red state, right? But this primary race has become divisive within the Republican Party. Is there concern among the state GOP that they could be doing serious damage before this potential face-off we're talking about? And do each of these candidates stack up in that race? You're absolutely right. This has been a very ugly and divisive primary contest. And Democrats actually uh, seem to suggest that they think that Moreno, who has the endorsement from Trump, is the weaker candidate. They've actually been running ads trying to boost Moreno in this contest. Uh, but Ohio is a state that Donald Trump won by eight percentage points in 2020. He also won it by eight percentage points in 2016. And there is the sense that if Sherrod Brown is going to be able to hold on uh, to his Senate seat, regardless of the opponent that he faces, he's going to actually have to win over Trump. Uh, he's going to have to end up having people who vote for Donald Trump in the presidential contest, but vote for him in the Senate. And that's going to be a tough situation for him. So other than Sherrod Brown's race, what other races are you paying close attention to today? There's some congressional primaries, Savannah, that we're watching. In Illinois, for example, there is another contest where the current congressman, uh, Mike uh, Bost, uh, who has the endorsement from uh, uh, former President Donald Trump, is getting a, a, a challenge from his right from a candidate who was a failed gubernatorial candidate from 2022. We're also watching, a uh, on in the Democratic side, Democratic Congressman Danny Davis in Illinois 7 is getting a challenge from his left. And then this isn't one of the states that's holding primaries today, but in California, we are getting the primary for uh, who will end up serving out the remainder of Kevin McCarthy's congressional seat. And if anyone in that contest gets more than 50 percent of the vote, they get to be seated immediately, which would bolster the Republicans' already fragile House majority. All right, Mark Murray, as always, we appreciate you. Thank you. Well, here in New York, former President Trump's lawyers are asking an appeals court to temporarily suspend 
the $464 million judgment against him and his co-defendants in his civil fraud case while he challenges it. They say Trump will not be able to get a bond for the full amount by next week in order to be able to appeal. That's when New York Attorney General Letitia James can start seizing properties and assets if he doesn't come up with the money. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos is here on set with a closer look at this. Danny, good morning. So tell us more about Trump's filing yesterday and why Trump is having a hard time securing money to post a bond. He's having a hard time because he doesn't have the money, and that's the problem. I mean, $450 million is something that if your business is not very liquid, in other words, if that money isn't in cash, you can't necessarily post the bond. The bond is designed to protect the plaintiff so that you don't just, a defendant doesn't appeal for years and then spend all the money they should have been paying to the plaintiff. The problem is that Trump simply doesn't have the liquid. This is something that people like me and others have been saying for weeks now, which is he's going to have a problem coming up with that because we already know he had to finance the significantly less sum in the E. Jean Carroll case. He didn't apparently have the cash or all the cash for that. So, I mean, it's no surprise here that he can't find a company to finance it because it's just a gigantic amount of money. Mm, absolutely. Let's talk about the hush money case. There's been some activity here. Last week, the judge scheduled a hearing for March 25th coming up here to sort out issues related to last minute evidence dumps. Yesterday, he also denied Trump's bid to prevent Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels from testifying. What do we need to know here? Walk us up to the latest. Are, are those details super important? How does that impact what's going to happen next? They are motions in limine. That's what these are called. Each side files them, and they're really each side's attempt at pruning the tree before you get to trial. And there's some significant decisions in this sort of uh, laundry list of motions that were decided. I mean, some of them are only, uh, only a paragraph is devoted to them, but they quietly may be very, very significant. For example, the judge has foreclosed the Trump defendants from introducing evidence of Michael Cohen's lack of credibility in the eyes of federal prosecutors. That is a very significant decision. However, it doesn't prevent the Trump defense from introducing evidence of Michael Cohen's lack of credibility. But I think that had they been able to introduce federal prosecutor's opinion that Michael Cohen was not a credible witness, that might have been significant. But that's the way motions in limine work. There are several different issues on both sides that each side asks the judge to either prevent coming into the, the case or to allow into the case. And they quietly may have a major impact on the case ultimately, although they just don't seem to yet. Let's talk through other cases here. The D.C. election interference trial, Florida classified documents, Georgia election interference trial. The former president and his team have been successful at delaying all of those. I mean, we don't really know what we're going to see and when here. Does this mean that we could be well into the presidential election season, if not potentially even after the election, before these get started? And what does that look like? In 2023, at the end of 2023, I said a lot of these trials will not go forward until 2025. Everyone said I was out of my mind. Mm. I kind of agreed with them, <laughs> but I stuck to my guns because I know that trial dates get moved. I can't tell you how often I get asked, you know, what's going on with this delay? And my answer to what's going on is the same thing that's going on with all criminal cases. Unexpected things happen. Let me say two examples from just the last few months. If you'd told me in December of 2023 that a motion would be filed in the Fulton County, Georgia case that would derail it for three months based on a, a romantic relationship between prosecutors, I would have said that right. sounds nuts. But mm. here we are. Things happen. And with these cases that are of such monumental importance, trial dates are going to get moved. That's why in 2023, it was reasonable to say that some of these cases not only would not get going until the election, but after the election and into 2025. And here we are. Mm. And, and of course, I couldn't point to a single thing that would delay it because you don't know what those things are. Uh, the prosecu prosecution romantic relationship motion, no one saw that coming. Uh, the hundreds of thousands of documents that the Southern District of New York apparently had, no one really saw that coming, although I argue that the party should have been aware. So you don't know, but delays happen. All right. Danny Sivalos, who's usually right. We should always listen to you. Not really. Thank but. you so much. Good to have you with us. Meanwhile, a former top Trump White House advisor is set to start serving prison time for refusing to testify before Congress about his involvement in efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election. Peter Navarro, a trade advisor to the former president, was sentenced in January to four months in prison for defying a congressional subpoena. 
Navarro appealed the sentence, but yesterday, Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts rejected his bid to remain free. He is set to report to federal prison in Miami later today. NBC News Justice reporter Ryan Riley joins us now. Ryan, good morning. Great to see you. So remind us how the issue got to the Supreme Court in the first place. Why was he subpoenaed to begin with, and then what was his reason for not, for not complying in his defense? Yeah, so back when Democrats controlled the House of Representatives and were running the January 6th committee, they subpoenaed both testimony and documents from Peter Navarro. And Peter Navarro sort of thought that these magic words, executive privilege, would sort of shut this whole thing down, even though he had written about January 6th and the lead up to it in his book. You know, had spoken publicly, repeatedly about this. Um, he said that, you know, claiming executive privilege, he expected to shut this all down. And that's not really the case here. Even if he made that claim of executive privilege, or rather if the former president made that claim of executive privilege, he would still have to show up for that actual testimony. And he didn't hear. He essentially just blew off the committee. Um, and that's sort of what he expected to end this. But ultimately, that's what got him uh, convicted in court uh, last year. And then he was sentenced in January after four months in federal prison. Uh, he's supposed to report today, actually, by 2 p.m. Uh, so now that the Supreme Court has rejected that, we can expect to see him uh, making that appearance and starting to serve his four months, Savannah. Chief Justice Roberts issued this order. What did it say? It said basically that this, you know, that there is no reason to delay uh, this uh, sentencing from from happening, from taking place, because there wasn't uh, there wasn't debate the legal basis for them to basically delay this. Um, he can still appeal on the merits, but of course he'll have already served uh, the sentence by the time that all plays out. And you know, legal experts think that this is a little bit of a of a stretch here in terms of actually getting rid of that sentence. But it is very rare for people to be sentenced uh, for contempt of Congress. It's not something that we see um, on a regular on a regular basis, especially if it was someone who worked at the White House. But, you know, his testimony really was essential here because he was at the center of this effort to overturn the 2020 election. In fact, Donald Trump's infamous Will Be Wild tweet was based on a story that was on a report that Navarro had written that was sort of based off of these crazy conspiracy theories about the election being stolen. That's what he was sort of boosting here. So, you know, his effort to sort of overturn the election really was at the center um, of, of this effort. And it's understandable why the January 6th committee wanted to talk to him. Ultimately, they didn't. So, you know, there's we could be finding out things down the line. You know, I think for years we'll be finding out new things about what exactly happened in the lead up to January 6th. Yeah. Ryan, um, let's broaden out if we can talk more about the Supreme Court here and a couple things they've done and are coming up. So they rejected those state attempts to ban former President Trump from 2024 presidential primary ballots. Um, uh, that was over his role on January 6th. Now they will be considering his immunity claims in his D.C. election interference case. Walk us through the pivotal role the Supreme Court could play this election year and what you're anticipating seeing. They really are playing a key role here. I mean, you know, that case, even just the Supreme Court hearing that case is just a huge win for Trump, as you were talking about in the earlier segment, sort of this delay, delay, delay tactic has really paid off uh, for the Trump campaign. We've seen that happen, you know, over and over and over again. And it doesn't even seem clear at this point that any of the various criminal trials that he is facing uh, are going to go to a trial. It's not a sure thing for sure uh, before the election. Uh, the New York case involving uh, the payoff to Stormy Daniels uh, is supposed to happen in April now, but originally it was supposed to happen in six days from now. It was supposed to happen um, on March 25th. So there's always these new things that can happen and come up. So, you know, the Supreme Court really will be at the center, especially of those federal cases, um, including both uh, the documents case and as well as uh, this interference uh, in the election case that was brought by Jack Smith in D.C. Ryan Riley, thank you so much. Now let's get to the latest in the Israel-Hamas war. Israeli defense forces have once again raided Gaza's largest hospital, prompting President Joe Biden to warn Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in a phone call on Monday that a planned ground invasion of Rafah without a humanitarian plan in place would be a mistake. This was the first conversation between the two leaders in more than a month and comes as the NBC News White House team is reporting that President Biden is growing more angry and anxious about the potential political fallout he may face over his handling of the conflict. NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba joins us now with more. Hey, Monica, good morning. So the White House has been grappling with how to respond if Israel does go against the president's warnings here and they decide to enter Rafah, something they have long said they do plan to do, and that is if they do so without a humanitarian plan in place. How has Israel responded to that issue? Do they have a plan that includes keeping those millions of civilians safe? 
the U.S. certainly hasn't seen it if a plan does indeed exist. And that is why the president is calling on the prime minister to be a little bit more upfront about what those details are and to discuss it. Israel maintains that they do have a way of trying to relocate these more than one and a half million civilians who really fled to to the south of Gaza because that's what they were told to do by Israel. But there just hasn't been proof of that in the international community. And so that's why this next step where they could potentially review some options for how this could work will really be critical to determining how this actually goes if indeed an actual large scale invasion of Rafah is imminent, Savannah. And Monica, a key outcome, as we understand from that call, is that Prime Minister Netanyahu agreed to send a delegation to Washington. And this is to talk, to try to understand more about what humanitarian plans could be possible, but also importantly for the U.S. to lay out an alternative approach when it comes to going after Hamas, because that, again, is why Israel is saying they have to go into this particular city, because that is where Hamas is. When is that meeting likely to take place, and does that mean that Israel will potentially slow their campaign in the meantime? Are they going to wait for this conversation, for this information, for these suggestions from the U.S. before taking any severe action? That is what the Biden administration is certainly hoping for. We know that these experts from Israel, this delegation, experts in humanitarian, military, and intelligence are going to be coming to meet with U.S. officials in the coming days. So we're not sure if that's really in the next 48 hours or in the next week or two, but we expect it to take place in the near future, which is something that the president really pushed for in this phone call because he wants to also push the prime minister to perhaps evaluate a plan that is a lot more targeted to really go into Rafa, to try to go in with these specific counterterrorism operations to take out high-level Hamas people, but not really put all of these civilians at risk. So that is what they're going to be pushing for, and they're going to sit down and look at these plans to see if that's something Israel would be willing to go for, because there's also just this major concern about the humanitarian crisis, which is growing, as we know, and famine appears to be imminent. Savannah. Monica, before I let you go, let's quickly talk about those political implications we mentioned. So I know your team, the White House team, has some new reporting about President Biden's concerns on how this could impact the upcoming election. What can you tell us about that? Well, we know that he's already been presented with some polling in certain battleground states where there are key constituencies who have rejected the president's handling of the war that really he saw and he was really upset by. And he knew that this was something that clearly was linked to that. And he did use some colorful language, we understand. And he lashed out at senior aides saying that he wanted to understand what they could do differently here. But we know that the U.S. has been clear that it hasn't changed any policy. It's not conditioning any yet. And so we'll see if this shifts into a new phase in the coming weeks. But so far, the U.S. has stood by Israel and its commitment to defend itself. All right. Right. Monica Alba, thank you so much. Great reporting. Well, now to Capitol Hill, where lawmakers are set to discuss a tentative deal to fund the Department of Homeland Security and avoid a partial government shutdown. Congress has until midnight on Friday to pass a deal to fund the Departments of State, Defense, Homeland Security, Labor and Health and Human Services, as well as a host of other agencies. For more, we are joined by NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles in Washington. Ryan, good morning. So what do we know about this tentative deal? Well, it looks like lawmakers are, have a deal that's going to give them just enough time to get it passed by both the House and Senate and signed into law by that Friday deadline at midnight. It, it appears that the big hang-up here in these negotiations came around the Department of Homeland Security. And they, of course, uh, are is the department that is responsible for dealing with the southern border and the situation uh, with the migrant crisis. Uh, House Republicans have been insistent that any additional funding to the Department of Homeland Security needs to be paired with significant policy changes. Uh, policy changes changes that Democrats have uh, largely been opposed to. Uh, the two sides have worked out their differences at this point. We're not exactly sure what the final deal looks like, but we're expected to get that legislative text later today that will give us an idea of what they exactly settled on. Of course, Savannah, this is where it could get difficult, because even though the leadership in both the House and Senate and the White House have agreed to this deal, every single member has to vote on it. And as we've known with this Congress, uh, there are no guarantees once a bill gets to the floor. Yeah, it's so true, Ryan. I mean, we've seen these deals with bipartisan leadership support fall apart recently. I mean, what do you think? What are the chances that that happens again, that this does get derailed, according to your sources? 
Yeah, I mean, everybody seems pretty optimistic this time around, Savannah. And, and what we've seen with this new speaker, Mike Johnson, is a willingness to avoid government shutdowns at all costs. Now, there could be some repercussions from him for him in that regard. It definitely means that if he puts this bill on the floor, it's going to require Democratic help in order to get over the finish line. It will likely have to be voted under suspension, uh, which is a special procedural provision that requires two-thirds of members of the House to pass the legislation. So that means there could theoretically even be more Democrats and Republicans that support this bill. It was a maneuver like that that, of course, got the former Speaker Kevin McCarthy in trouble with the right-wing flank of the House of, uh, of Representatives and ultimately led to him being booted as Speaker of the House. This time around, conservatives don't seem to be as anxious to do the same to Mike Johnson, but we'll have to see what this legislation looks like and if it upsets them enough that they're willing to do something as dramatic as pushing uh, Johnson out of office if he ends up supporting this package. And, and Ryan, quickly remind us what a partial shutdown could look like should this be derailed. Well, this uh, particular uh, partial government shutdown could have significant impacts across the country because it involves some of the most important departments that the federal government runs, uh, things like the State Department, the Pentagon, and, of course, Homeland Security. From the Pentagon's perspective, it could mean that paychecks to active-duty military members could be held up. And then from the Homeland Security aspect of it, of course, there is the situation at the southern border, which remains an ongoing crisis. But then also TSA falls under the Homeland Security banner. So that means every TSA agency Agent that checks you in when you go to the airport could be in danger of their paychecks being held up. They still have to come to work because they are considered essential. In the past, though, when we've dealt with shutdowns like this, some TSA workers have called in sick. So there is a lot at stake here if they can't get this bill done by Friday at midnight. All right, Ryan Nobles, thank you so much. You know you'll be watching. Much of the country is kicking off the first official day of spring with wintry weather. Let's get a check on your morning news now weather with Angie Lastman, who's tracking freeze alerts in the south and more. Hey, Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, Savannah. Yep, the calendar says spring, but the forecast outside across parts of the southeast uh, definitely still says winter. We've got these freeze warm Mornings in effect where you see that bright pink from Charlotte to Atlanta out towards Jackson and even into portions of Texas we are waking up to some chilly conditions needing the extra layer for sure temperatures right now hovering right around 30 in places like Huntsville Bowling Green Tuscaloosa sitting into the 20s right now we've got Memphis at 32 degrees Little Rock into the mid 30s and even as far south as places like Georgia still sitting just barely into those 30s we're going to continue to see these temperatures for a couple more hours before we start to rebound and we will do do just that here by the time we get into the afternoon hours, but we're not where we should be. Temperatures, even this afternoon as we head to the 60s across this region, most spots will be running well below normal for this time of year. We're talking 5 to 10 degrees below where we should be, so Tuscaloosa will hit 60 degrees. Mobile ends up at 63 degrees. We've got Macon at 62 degrees. Temperatures, though, will quickly bounce back to where they should be here as we get into your Wednesday and your Thursday. We round out our, our work week even with some temperatures in places like Pensacola, still into those low 70s. Brunswick will hit those low 70s all the way through the end of the work week as well. And speaking of wintry weather, we've got some uh, lake effect snow that we're dealing with, some snow showers surrounding the Great Lakes. That's where we're going to see this system kind of work through through the day today. It looks like the heaviest of that snow will be downwind of Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. We'll pick up a good amount of snow in some of those spots and we'll still be dealing with a couple of these snow showers here and maybe even some rain across parts of the mid-Atlantic and coastal northeast as we get through the day tomorrow, uh, but we'll slowly but surely start to see that snow wrapping up here as we get into the later parts of our work week. In the meantime, though, picking up maybe an inch or two in some of the more widespread areas, but notice again downwind of the lake, six to even eight inches of isolated uh, snow accumulation is possible. By tomorrow, we'll look for some general thunderstorms across parts of the south, specifically Texas and Oklahoma, uh, and we'll keep that forecast um, fairly quiet for the rest of the country uh, as we look through the day today. Savannah, western warmth and plenty of sunshine through the middle of the country. Western warmth, love to see it. All right, Angie, thank you so much. Well, there's much more to come here on Morning News Now. Speaking of some weather, later this hour, spring backward. Well, today, as Angie mentioned, marks the official start of spring, but unofficially in certain areas, it started to look like this weeks ago. So why the last few weeks of winter could be a sign of the seasons to come. And new developments in those royal rumors involving the Princess of Wales. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We're back now with a new legal development in the battle over immigration. The Supreme Court has ruled to extend a temporary block on Texas's new immigration law. It's known as SB4. 
An order issued by Justice Samuel Alito said the bill would remain on pause, quote, pending further order. Well, the controversial law would allow local police to arrest people suspected of illegally entering Texas from Mexico. It was set to go into effect last night before the hold was extended. Earlier this year, the Biden administration sued to strike down the law, arguing it violated the federal government's authority over immigration. But officials in Texas have pushed back, claiming the measure complements federal law and they should be allowed to enforce it. We will, of course, keep you updated with developments there. Well, now let's take a look at the growing crisis in Haiti. The State Department says about 1,000 Americans have reached out asking about options to get out of Haiti. That number is way up from this time just last week, where the airport is still closed because of escalating gang violence. This violence comes after years of instability for Haiti. NBC News correspondent Gabe Gutierrez, who has covered the country throughout his career, breaks it down for us this morning. Haiti's capital on fire. Violence in the streets as gangs fight to keep control of 80% of the city. The UN says more than 360,000 people are internally displaced with millions in need of food. But the chaos now, years in the making. In 1804, Haiti won its independence from the French and became the first black-led republic in the world. But in exchange for freedom, France made it pay reparations. It put Haiti into a cycle of debt and dependency. In 1915, after several Haitian presidents were assassinated or ousted, the U.S. occupied Haiti. Over about two decades, it destabilized Haitian society and killed thousands. Decades later, two brutal leaders ruled. A father. You should have a strong man in every country. And then his son, both using a paramilitary force to shut down opposition. Then, a flurry of leaders and coups and another U.S. intervention. In 2004, the U.N. stepped in. That mission has become kind of a textbook case of what not to do in U.N. missions. The soldiers have been implicated in sex trafficking and drug trafficking rings. It was enormously violent and killed thousands of civilians in Haiti. In 2010, a devastating earthquake killing about 220,000 people and leaving one and a half million without homes. Aid flowed in from around the world. The people of Haiti will have the full support of the United States. A charity telethon raising millions. Haiti, I can see you. Hello. But experts say politicians took advantage of the chaos, stealing aid. There's been so much money that's coming in the country, and yet there's literally roads to nowhere. Just months after the earthquake, U.N. troops introduced cholera to Haiti, starting an outbreak that has killed about 10,000 people. Later came Hurricane Matthew. The eye of the storm is about to slam into the southwestern tip of this country. And a fuel crisis compounding the pain in Haiti. In 2021, Haiti's president, Jovenel Moïse, was assassinated. Ariel Henry, backed by the U.S., became the de facto leader. Violence escalated. This has become daily life here in Haiti. Tires burning on city streets, protesters furious. As Henri pushed back elections again and again, Haitians grew angry. When Henri went to Kenya to get international support, gangs orchestrated a mass prison break and demanded he resign. Henri says he will resign once a transitional government brokered by other countries is formed. But many Haitians say more foreign intervention is not the answer. He says the country is ours. No one will decide for us. We must take our destiny into our own hands. Our thanks to Gabe Gutierrez for that report. Let's stay on international news now. A new video has surfaced of the Princess of Wales as rumors fly about her whereabouts. NBC News international correspondent Josh Letterman joins us now. Hey, Josh, good morning. Hey, good morning, Savannah. For all of us who have been following the controversy uh, over Princess Kate, this was a big development. The Princess of Wales was spotted near her home in Windsor at a farm store doing some shopping with Prince William at her side. Now, Princess Kate has been out of the public eye since an unspecified abdominal surgery back in January, but speculation about her condition has intensified following that doctored family photo that the palace later said that Kate herself had photoshopped. Now, let's head to Slovakia, where there have been two bear attacks in just three days. And now five people are injured after that latest attack, including a 72-year-old man with a cut on his head. Officials in a northern town there have declared a state of emergency and urged residents to stay close to home. Six armed patrols are now hunting for the bear. And finally, let's go to Iran, where it turns out humans 
4,000 years ago were just as vain as we are. Archaeologists have found a small stone vial containing a red cosmetic that they believe is lipstick. Probably it is the oldest example of lipstick ever documented. It's made up of deep red minerals and waxy substances that were made from vegetables. No word yet on whether they were spending their entire paycheck on those cosmetics. <laughs> Savannah? Very good question. Josh, thank you so much. Coming up, a conversation that could save lives. When we come back, we talk about the rising risk of colon cancer in young people and what doctors want you to know to stay healthy. Plus, workaholics, this one is for you. The new research that draws a fine line between passionate and problematic when it comes to your career. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. It's Colon Cancer Awareness Month, and we are taking a look at how to improve our overall colon health. Now, colon cancer is the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths worldwide. Let's bring in Dr. Lynn O'Connor for more on this. She's a colorectal surgeon and cancer specialist, also the first black woman to become an NYPD surgeon. Very cool. So great to have you with us. Good morning, doctor. Thanks for being here. So before we get into colon cancer, let's just start with like colon health. Like even before you know, you ha hopefully get to the extreme of being diagnosed with something like that. What are important things to know about our colon health? How to be healthy? How to know if we're healthy? It's so important to have colon, good colon health because the colon is really the powerhouse of the cell. Our gut monitors how we, how we, how we feel throughout the day. Mm. It's also important in our immune system. So what we feed our gut is going to just basically tenor how we feel throughout the day. Have you ever gotten up and you're unable to have your normal bigger bowel movement? You feel sluggish. That constipation slows you down. You feel fatigued. But if you're eating right, if you're getting the proper foods and nutrition, you have energy, you feel exuberant, you feel like you, you're, you, you can really just tackle the world when you have a good colon health. But if you're not, then that's when you're tired and that's when you're not going to be functioning well and that can be indicative of other problems as well too. So let's talk about this fact that we, uh, you know, now this is multiple conversations which I think is really good, ringing the alarm, getting the information out there that colon cancer is impacting younger people. Yes. Uh, let's tell the audience, right as you came into the studio when we were still in commercial break before we came back, you said, how's your colon health? And I was honest, I was like, you know, <laughs> I think I feel okay but I guess I don't really know because I'm 32 years old, you're not recommended to get a colonoscopy until you're 45 years old, that's something I've never done, Trans Apparently. So how, what is going on with young people and what should young people be keeping in mind in order to advocate for themselves? So their doctor would never think you need a colonoscopy now. If their insurance isn't going to cover it, if it's not on anybody's radar, how do we make it so that we are checking on this for ourselves? This is so important because we are seeing an uptick in colorectal cancer in younger and younger patients. And we've been seeing this since the 80s with a 1% to 2% increase in colon cancer and a 3% increase in rectal cancer in just a 20 to 39 year age group wow. as it is. And the problem is we're not thinking about it. It's not on our radar. We've decreased the screening age from 50 to 45 so we can catch younger patients who are having colorectal cancer because screening affects cure. If we're going to be able to screen them earlier, we can remove polyps before they become a cancer. We can find a cancer early and we can affect the cure. So it's important that if younger patients are experiencing symptoms such as rectal bleeding, change in bowel habits, constipation, weight loss, don't wait. Speak to your primary care physician and talk to them about your symptoms and see if screening is one of the proper modalities we can do for you. And actually, even alternatively to weight loss, one of our very brave and impressive colleagues here, an NBC News correspondent, Antonia Hilton, she shared her story with something like this, where she actually said she started noticing bloating and like even her face looking different. Are there other things like that where you should just be like, if something's up, ask your doctor if it could be connected to this because we're seeing these numbers rise? Absolutely, and some of the things we think commonly, we have rectal bleeding. A lot of people have rectal bleeding, they think it's just hemorrhoids. They have, and women, you know, we get, we get older, we get abdominal bloating, we think it's just our period. Mm. So any of those symptoms, if you're outside of your norm, then that's what you need to pay attention mm. to. Every now and then someone will have diarrhea, someone will have constipation. But if you're consistently losing weight unintentionally, if you're experiencing rectal bleeding, if something is not your normal your normal um, uh, way of, of doing things every day, yeah. if you're outside of that, 
that should trigger an alarm. Let me get checked. What are proactive things that young people can be doing to think about their colon health? I mean, when, when you talk about the gut, like especially on TikTok, yes. honestly, there's like so much about you know the gut's the second brain. And, exactly. Like, here's your gut it really like, is. Apple cider vinegar this, <laughs> and take a dose of this, and, and you know, you're kind of like, how do I keep up with it all? But is nutrition super important? Or, like, what are some baseline things for your gut? Health? We are we are what we eat. Nutrition is key. So you want to make sure that you have a good high fiber diet. You want more fruits. You want more vegetables. You want to stay away from the uh, you know moderate your alcohol. Smoking, clearly you don't want to do, mm. but you want to get like, eat the Mediterranean diet. I always tell my patients, eat the rainbow. Make sure you have a good source of, of mm. whole grains, nuts, fruits, vegetables. That's going to be key because what you feed yourself, you are what you eat. And we can really do a lot moving forward with making sure that our diet is healthy and that we're physically active. Mm. Those are some of the things that you can do to make sure that you're staving off the risk for colorectal cancer. And if you do have symptoms, even as a younger patient, make sure you get screened. Mm. Absolutely. Dr. Lynn O'Connor, thank you so much for being here. Really good conversation, informative, can help save lives. And get yourself checked out if you feel like something's up. Advocate yes. for yourself. Absolutely. That's, what that's important. Dr. O'Connor, thank you so much. Good to have you with us. Well, now it's time for our weekly mental health check-in. Let's start off with a new warning from experts about teenage boys and their mental health. And then we're also going to talk about the secrets to happiness, maybe coming from the tiniest packages. We're learning more about what experts say toddlers can teach us. Well, here to help break down these headlines is psychotherapist Dr. Robbie Ludwig. Dr. Robbie, always great to see you. So let's jump right in. I mean, we've talked so much about the mental health struggles young people suffer from. And a lot of that what we, that we talk about is how girls are suffering. But experts are also saying that teenage boys, the quote here is that they are disappearing from the mental health conversation, which just sounds really scary. They have these symptoms going undetected. Yes. Tell us why this is happening and what our viewers can do to support these young boys in their lives and keep this in mind. As you mentioned, Savannah, our ideas about depression are very female oriented. So it's melancholy and crying and admitting some upset. But with boys, the picture looks very different. They can get irritable, easily triggered, angry. And that could be a sign that they are, in fact, battling with depression. It makes a lot of sense because uh, when you're angry and irritable, you feel less vulnerable. And, and boys in our culture don't want to feel that sense of vulnerability or looking weak in any way. So this information is really, really powerful. And it allows parents also to observe these changes and perhaps make the proper interventions if they see that their boys are behaving differently, but it doesn't look like our traditional ideas of what depression presents like. Mm. So important to know what exactly to look for and, and to be on the lookout. There's so much, too, when it comes to boys have been reporting on eating disorders that kind of go under the radar. Like, it's important yes. to try to get under the hood there with our young boys. Um, now, Doctor, let's talk about workaholism. I mean, this is like, yes. you know, a work addiction. <laughs> it's so easy to get sucked into your job. I know this firsthand, especially if you love what you do. But researchers are saying this is a problem for a lot of people. So uh, how do you know when maybe this is going too far? Like, you think you're super passionate about your job. You love it. You feel like if you are away from it, it's going to suffer. Uh, but how do you know when maybe this is kind of like crossing a line? It's becoming something else. It's a little too much. It's not healthy for you. What can we do to kind of try to keep a healthy balance? This is a really tough one because culturally, when people work really hard, um, they almost have bragging rights. And this is what our idea of being successful looks like. However, if you are working round the clock, if you are preoccupied with work and it's damaging the other areas of your life, if physically you are having uh, negative symptoms and, and your body is wearing down, if you don't have friendships, if you don't have connections with family, then your life might be too tilted in one direction. And we still don't really understand what causes it. Some people feel it's being parentified as a child, or maybe it's an escape from feeling depressed or anxious. Uh, but it is good to keep aware it's about the mm -hmm. balance. And if you are noticing that physically you're exhausted, having a hard time keeping up, sometimes we can notice these things not necessarily necessarily emotionally, but physiologically. Definitely. Doctor, we only have a few seconds here, but I do want to talk about, let's, let's end on a happy note, the happiness we can learn from toddlers. What should we be looking out for? And what, as an adult, can we really try to put into practice realistically? 
Oh God, I love this one. So toddlers are really good at positive self-talk. They're good at laughing. They're good at moving. They're really good at asking questions and they just are really in life. And they also like to nap, which is a good one. So research is saying if we can borrow a little bit from the toddler lifestyle and mindset, we will be in good mental health and feel a sense of emotional and physical well-being. There you go. Love to see it. Dr. Robbie, always great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. Coming up, seasonal changes. That might be the official first day of spring, but by the looks of it, you would have thought it started weeks ago in some places. Angie's coming back to break down how climate change is inspiring those early blooms. And dark side of the earth in just a few weeks, parts of the country expected to go dark from a total solar eclipse. What you need to know if you want to experience it in person, that's next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. It is the first day of spring today, but for many places across the country, warmer weather actually rolled in weeks ago. You might have seen some leaves budding on trees. That's usually one of the first signs that spring has sprung. Let's welcome back our very own Angie Lassman. She's here to have a little chit chat and she's at the desk the whole time, not over at the board. Glad this to be so with fun. you. <laughs> we love it. All right, Angie, tell us some of the signs that it actually is the seasons are changing no matter what the calendar says mm -hmm. no matter what the date is that actually means like hey okay different things are happening in the environment and now it's more spring like yeah and i think you know you and i just had a conversation in the commercial break about we see the leaves yes. budding that's the first indication i think that everybody sees mm -hmm. that shows us that we're transitioning out of winter and into spring but i mean you've got places like washington dc where it's much faster and happening much earlier than it ever has before we've got cherry blossoms that are reaching people Peak bloom two weeks earlier than normal. We're, of course, if you look to places like Boston, if you live in that area, you might notice the magnolia trees are blooming there. Um, it's not just, of course, things like the flowers and the plants, though. Really interestingly, in places like Vermont, where, of course, maple syrup is a big thing, the conditions need to be picture perfect for folks to, to be able to get that sap from the roots of the tree all the way into the trunk and to tap the tree. What has to happen is you basically have to have above freezing temperatures during the daytime and below freezing temperatures at nighttime. If those conditions wow. are happening at a, you know earlier time periods uh, in the year, then people are, of course, are are not being able to do that. It's so specific. And then you have mm. you know of course things like the allergy season that we know is changing and water supply being affected. So there's really a multitude of things that I think if you just look around, you'll be able to see it. What's that like winter sports like skiing like snowboarding? What's yeah, recreation. That? is a big thing and I think it's not just you know of course we think of yay it's getting warmer right. and we can go outside and enjoy outdoor activities but you've got a lot of changes to recreation we of course have had low snow uh, you know below average snow in places like the Northeast and that's made a big impact on resorts and mm. ski resorts and things like that where of course the season is ending it's much shorter it's ending earlier you've got uh, places like the Great Lakes who have had record low ice coverage this year that means that things like snowmobile or pond hockey, a favorite from where I grew up in Michigan. Mm -hmm. All of those are a little, they're too dangerous, frankly, to do on, on these lakes that the ice coverage is basically non-existent. Um, ice fishing has been problematic. The season there is much shorter. So there's a lot of these things that you have that are, are just different. And places like ski resorts, they're changing up, changing things up. They're basically diversifying in order to make right. it so that they can, you know, reach their bottom line with things like hiking trails or, you know, water parks being added on so that their shrinking season isn't affecting them, you know, financially. Yeah, because it's impacting people's livelihoods. You think mm -hmm. about ice fishing. I mean, people are doing that to right. make a living. It's exactly. not just a, a recreational necessarily. And have been for decades. Exactly. Um, what? So if winter was warmer. Yeah. Does that mean like generally are we like a spring warmer? Is summer hotter? Like, is that yeah. what we're going to start to see? So this is the question. I think you ask me these things. A lot of people in my life ask me, is this all climate change? Of course, we have, you know, climate cycles that we go into, climate patterns that mm -hmm. we're in. We're in an El Nino. We're going to transition to a La Nina. But but at the end of the day, human caused climate change is impacting this. And we have more spring days that are warmer than normal in a place like Washington, D.C., where you just saw the graphic there. They're talking 10 or more days that are above normal during the springtime. That's pretty impressive. And spring temperatures across the country, about two degrees Fahrenheit or larger from for across the U.S. This is Washington, D.C., about two in, or two degrees rather 
there um, warmer than normal uh, for their average temperature. That's pretty impressive. And it looks like the signs are pointing to, yes, especially in the northern tier of the country, through spring, we'll probably have warmer than normal temperatures. Um, and we'll see what summer brings. And I have a stomachache. This, this wah, really wah. makes me anxious. It's okay. There's things we can do. You know, it all is not lost. We, we of course, have things that we can do to make sure that So we should do a segment on that yes. soon so that there everybody feels a little bit better or, like, they can do their part. Let's Andrew Lassman, a really important conversation to have, though. Thank you very much for doing it. Fun to have you, you over here it. with us. Well, something else is happening this spring. A total solar eclipse. This is on April 8th. Millions of people will be plunged into darkness from Texas to Maine. Well, if you want to see the phenomenon in person, it's going to be busy in cities like like Dallas, rental car services are already seeing, get this, six times more reservations compared to the same period last year. But if you do plan to travel to get the best view of the eclipse in April, we've got to look at how you can get the most out of your experience and how you could do so and stay safe. Spokesperson for AAA, Aixa Diaz, joins us now to give her best travel advice for the eclipse next month. Aixa, good morning. Great to have you with us. So, I mean, this event is, I mean, so many people have had this on their calendar for years, space enthusiasts, people who saw that last one, I think, what was it, seven or eight years ago or so. So if somebody is just starting to plan their trip to see the eclipse. Where are some of these good places to start to research travel plans? And what do we know is going to be somewhere where you're going to be like, wow, I actually saw an eclipse. It was, it was a great place to be to experience this. Good morning, Savannah. 2017 was the last eclipse. So, so many people went to those places, loved it, and want to do it again. And some people are just realizing, wow, there's an April 8th eclipse happening now. I want to go. The first thing AAA recommends right now is determine a city that you want to go to. Most people drive to the eclipse. So, if you're looking along the path of totality from Texas all the way up to New England, AAA booking data shows that Dallas, Austin, and San Antonio are the top cities where people want to go see the eclipse, but also Indianapolis, Cleveland, and Buffalo are high on that list. Some people are making weekend trips out of it, so maybe going to see Niagara Falls while they're in Buffalo. So think about how you're going to how you're going to do it and where you're going to go. Also figure out where you're going to stay because AAA booking data is showing that hotels for these cities along the path of totality are 48% more expensive that weekend in April compared to last year. Wow. So do you have friends or family you could stay with along the path? That makes it easier. If you can stay within walking distance of where you're going to go see the eclipse, even better because traffic is very bad the day of the eclipse, especially right afterward. Everyone's leaving at the same time. Not everyone arrives at the same time. So keep that in mind. Do you want to maybe walk back to the hotel, back to a friend's house? But also keep in mind when you're going to be leaving. And remember, this is spring break season, Savannah, so more families are going to be out traveling. Oh, just all compounding of people being on the roads and in <laughs> hotels. What are the kinds of things that a first-time eclipse viewer, eclipse chaser, might not think to plan for that you can help us out with? Well, first of all, you have to have the glasses. Do not look at the eclipse without your eclipse glasses on. So that's <laughs> the first thing you have to have. But I think that the main thing that catches people off guard, and I've talked to AAA travel agents about this, is that people just don't expect the, the sheer amount of traffic that happens afterward. People will sit in traffic for hours, potentially afterward, if they don't plan accordingly. We also talk about safety tips. We don't want you wearing your safety glasses while you're driving. Obviously, when you're driving, your priority should be on the road, looking ahead, have your visor down and keep your eyes on the road. Also, don't pull over on the side of the road to watch the eclipse. Plan ahead and go to a safe place where you can park your vehicle safely and be in a location where you can look at the eclipse and not worry about cars on the side of the road. And if you are driving during the eclipse, you have uh, an appointment, you can't be out there enjoying it. Keep, keep in mind that pedestrians are going to have their eyes up in the sky. So be more mindful of people walking around during the eclipse. But one of the things we want to stress is that safety is important. How you watch the eclipse is important. But also make sure that you have your glasses on. Just don't drive with them on. Don't drive with them on. Watch for those pedestrians. Lots of driving-related, I think, safety <laughs> lessons we could learn here. Aika Sadiaz, thank you so much for joining us. Happy eclipse watching. So much fun. Good to have you thank with you. us. Thank you. Well, financial headlines now. An investigation has been opened into a fatal car accident allegedly involving Ford's driver assistance technology. CNBC Silvana Hanau joins us this morning with that and other money news. Hey, Silvana. Hey, Savannah. Good morning to you. Yes, yeah, so federal safety regulators are probing a recent fatal accident involving a Ford SUV 
that's suspected to have been using the automaker's advanced driver assistance technology. Last month, a Ford Mustang Mach-E struck the rear of a Honda SR a CRV that was stopped in a lane on a highway in Texas. The Honda driver later died, and the police report says the Ford system was partially engaged at the time of the crash. Unilever announcing plans to spin off its ice cream business, which includes popular brands such as Ben & Jerry's and Magnum. The move is part of a cost-cutting program for the consumer products giant and could result in more than 7,000 job cuts. Unilever bought Ben & Jerry's from the company's founders back in 2000. And Selena Gomez has reportedly hired advisors to weigh offers for her cosmetics company, Rare Beauty. Gomez and her team launched the business in 2020 with a focus on liquid cosmetics that could be applied with minimal tools. Its blush product became a viral hit on TikTok. Rare Beauty has been named one of the most sought-after takeover targets with an estimated value of $2 billion. Bloomberg reports Gomez is expected to remain involved in the business, Savannah. Wow, two billion, my goodness. Two billion. Oh, right. yeah. Savannah, thank you so much. You got it. Well, coming up, from fired to on fire. Up next, the unlikely Cinderella story of one college hoops coach who's taking his team dancing just days after being let go. Stay with us. This is Morning News Now. Finally this hour, the Long Beach State men's basketball team is dancing into NCAA's March Madness, but their spot on the bracket is a kind of bittersweet victory. Just last week, Dan Munson was being let go after nearly two decades as their head coach. But that hasn't stopped him or his team. Let's just say he is going out with a bang. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson has the story. If you made a top 10 list of the most unlikely scenarios heading into March Madness, this has to be number one. Dan Munson and the Beach have punched their ticket to the NCAA tournament. It has been a wild work week for head coach Dan Munson. After 17 long years, the school parted ways with Munson after a terrible end to the season, five straight losses. We agreed to, to part, and uh, I, I wished I didn't want it to be about me. So now, the school and Munson made uh, a mutual decision. You know, so He'd stay to finish the well. final games. And that is when you cue the craziest Cinderella story in college ball this year. What do you think it was specifically that lit that fire? Monday was a, an emotional day. I, I mean, it, it was the, the, probably the worst day of the week and by far the best day maybe of my life. In the run of a lifetime, with the coach's legacy on the line, the beach started bawling out of its mind. Long Beach scoring three wins in three days. I knew that how much they loved me when I left on Monday, and they showed it all week. By the end of that streak, just six days after Munson was sacked, he and his boys are putting an extension on their own March Madness. It's what we all dream of, and we're going to live the dream this week. Punching a premium ticket to the last dance for Coach Dan. Our thanks to Steve Patterson for that report. Well, Long Beach State will be one of the first teams to tip off the tournament with their game against the Arizona Wildcats this Thursday. Lots to watch for there. Well, that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Don't go anywhere, though. The news continues right now. Good morning. Thanks for joining us this Tuesday. I'm Savannah Sellers. Joe is off this morning. Right now on Morning News Now, millions of Americans are shivering in a deep freeze as positively polar temperatures grip much of the South on the first day of spring. We've got your full forecast and what you need to know as you get your day started. Also, a critical phone call between President Biden and Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Monday will bring you the president's stern warning to Netanyahu against a possible military operation in Rafah as Israel again raids Gaza's largest hospital. And on Capitol Hill this morning, crisis averted. Another government shutdown could be staved off this week after congressional leaders came to a tentative deal overnight to secure funding for homeland security and the southern border. But will it pass in the House and in the Senate? We will take you to Washington in just a moment. We are also watching your health later in the hour with a closer look at one popular diet trend that new research shows could come with a hidden risk. But we're going to start this morning, as I mentioned, with the unseasonable temperatures across the country on this first day of spring. Happy spring. Washington, D.C.'s famous cherry blossoms are in an early peak bloom as the area has been feeling that warmer than usual weather. Meanwhile, in the south, 
23 million people from Texas to North Carolina are under freeze alerts as temperatures dipped into the 20s overnight. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park is in Nashville, which had freezing temperatures overnight. She joins us with the very latest. Kathy, good morning. Great to have you on with us. So just how cold is it there? You look pretty bundled up. And how long are these chilly temperatures going to last? Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. At last check, it is a cool 26 degrees here in Nashville. But fortunately, this will be short lived because I looked at the forecast and it's expected to kind of tick up closer to 60 degrees later on this afternoon. So that's something that we'll be following through the, the rest of the week. So a bitter blast of cold weather this morning, but a nice warm up ahead. Yeah, what a dichotomy also, Kathy, to be talking to you about how it's in the 20s, but then all those flowers have totally bloomed behind you, right? I mean, this is where we're kind of in this confusing thing. And we had earlier this year, the South seeing these unseasonably high temperatures. How is that impacting mm -hmm. crops in places like Tennessee and the Carolinas, this kind of confusing back and forth on the weather? Yeah, that's a, a great question, because uh, because of this cold snap, it can be very damaging to crops and vegetation. So. Ahead of this cold snap, we saw farmers in South Carolina covering up those crops. And then here in Nashville, we're at the Teakwood Estate and Gardens. You see thousands of tulips in full bloom right now. But I took a closer inspection, and they're kind of drooping. They're a little sad right now because, as I said, <laughs> we're about 26 degrees. There's a little bit of frost on the leaves and on some of the petals. But once again, um, I'm told that they're expected to kind of perk back up again once the sun comes out and the temperature climbs a little bit closer to 60 degrees. But, yeah, it is damaging, especially for those crops. But I'm told these tulips are pretty resilient. Yeah, from here, they look great. And you can't see the sad, droopy aspect. But thank you for letting <laughs> us know. Kathy, also, the South is not the only place that's seeing really cold weather. What other parts of the country are being impacted by this freeze watch again that is coming on the first day of spring? Yeah, I think you mentioned at the top of the show, roughly 23 million Americans across the southeast, also lower Mississippi Valley under freeze warnings right now. So even major metropolitan cities like Charlotte, Atlanta, Memphis, they are waking up in the 30s this morning. And I should note, um, winter really is trying to hang on because the National Weather Service is actually tracking another major winter storm headed to the Upper Plains, northern uh, Midwest region. So a lot to kind of follow. But yes, it it is officially spring, sort of. Yeah, exactly. Savannah? <laughs> yeah, I guess the calendar says so, but the weather and what it feels like doesn't say so. Kathy Park, thank you so much. Well, let's stay on this, and actually let's get to snowfall that's going to be happening in certain parts of the country, including the Great Lakes this morning. Angie Lastman is back with us with your forecast. Hey, Angie. Hey there, Savannah. Good morning to you. Talk about weather whiplash. Last week, we were dealing with temperatures way above normal. Some spots seeing 60-plus temperature, 60-degree temperatures or higher. Uh, now we're dealing with a little bit of snow across portions of the Great Lakes. You heard Kathy talk about this briefly. We've got the snow happening here, uh, really downwind of the lakes, parts of Michigan, parts of Pennsylvania, New York, picking up with some of that additional additional snow this morning with more on the way here as the day goes on. Here's why. We've got this little system that's going to work across this region, bringing us the potential for some snowfall. You'll notice it starts to kind of wind down across portions of Michigan, but places like downwind of Lake Erie and Lake Ontario will continue to get, get a snow here as we go through the day today and even potentially into tomorrow. That's where the heaviest of the snow bands will set up uh, and picking up a couple of inches in some of those spots. There's a look at tomorrow. Did you notice that little batch of rain that starts to work? through portions of the mid-Atlantic mid -Atlantic and coastal northeast. That'll impact us through the daytime hours. We'll also see some of that snow still downwind of the lakes. Much of it will start to wrap up here, especially as the day goes on, but we could see some of those snow showers lingering even into the evening hours. Here's what we're expecting as far as accumulations. Not all that impressive for the widespread amounts. I think an inch to two inches is more likely, but notice where you see the pink right there. Uh, that's anywhere from six to eight inches. So some spots, isolated areas could pick up about a half of a foot, maybe a little more here by the time we get through the day tomorrow. As far as those uh, freeze alerts are concerned, still, just as Kathy said, 23 million people, including in this across the southeast. We've got Texarkana, Little Rock, Memphis, Huntsville, Atlanta, Montgomery, Charlotte, all included in this. And this is going to last through this morning because our temperatures into the 20s in a lot of these spots. A couple spots into the 30s, a few hanging onto the 40s, but we've got Atlanta at 33 degrees, hovering right around freezing, Huntsville into the upper 20s, Memphis into the 30s, places like Monroe and Hattiesburg into the 30s. This, of course, not great for crops, especially when we've had that early kind of signal of some warmth. 
month already in that bit of transition into spring. Now we've got these temperatures really causing some difficulty when it comes to the crops, of course. As we get into the afternoon hours, temperatures will rebound, but not quite to where they should be. We get into the 60s in Macon and Columbia. Jackson heads to 61 degrees, but that temperature about 10 degrees below normal for this time of year. We will bounce back and in a hurry. As we get into tomorrow, temperatures return to the 70s across much of this region. Atlanta, you can see, hits 73 degrees tomorrow, Thursday at 72 degrees. A bit of a temperature dip by Friday, but overall uh, a milder next couple of days to come. Elsewhere across the country, western warmth in full swing. We've got plenty of sunshine for the middle of the country as we go through the day today and looking ahead to tomorrow. A few thunderstorms to watch here in places like Texas and Oklahoma. We'll, of course, see some colder air spilling into portions of the northern plains, and those snow showers and windy conditions will still remain, but I think the place to go, I don't know, Savannah, how about the West Coast? We've got plenty of sunshine there, maybe the Southeast, plenty of sunshine uh, for our friends across the, the Sunshine State, living up to the name. Um, overall, uh, some quiet conditions for most of us today and tomorrow, but dealing with the wintry weather in a yeah. couple of spots. I was just on assignment in LA yesterday, and I can confirm it was lovely. It was delightful. Yeah, <laughs> landed much later than I <laughs> wish was the case, early well, this you, morning, really, and it was freezing, so it, that was a rude you awakening. You great. Home. Yeah. <laughs> well rested. Not my doing, but thank Thank you very much. Thanks, Angie. Of course. Well, this morning we are learning more about that critical phone call between President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu amid rising tensions over the war in Gaza. The president issued a warning against a planned military operation in the city of Rafah while also discussing the prospects of a ceasefire. NBC News international correspondent Raf Sanchez in Tel Aviv is in Tel Aviv and has the latest here. Hey, Raf, good morning. Savannah, good morning. The hunger crisis in Gaza is growing by the hour, and so is the sense of alarm at the White House about this potential Israeli ground assault on the city of Rafah. Now we are seeing the president intervening personally to try to convince Israel to change course. This morning, President Biden trying to head off a major new Israeli operation in Gaza. In their first call in more than a month, the president urging Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu to abandon plans to assault the city of Rafah, where more than a million Palestinian civilians are sheltering. They have nowhere else to go. Gaza's other major cities have largely been destroyed. The White House says Israel should pursue Hamas leaders in Rafah with targeted raids, but that a major ground attack would be a mistake. It would lead to more innocent civilian deaths, worse in the already dire humanitarian crisis, deepen the anarchy in Gaza, and further isolate Israel internationally. The White House also saying that American and Israeli teams will meet soon in Washington to discuss other approaches. The president's warning came hours after Israeli forces stormed into Al Shifa Hospital, saying Hamas fighters were operating inside. But Palestinian officials say attacking a hospital is a potential war crime and that thousands of civilians are sheltering at Al Shifa, hoping for safety and for food. A new UN-backed report says half of Gaza's population is now facing catastrophic hunger and that in northern Gaza, famine is now imminent. More aid arriving by air and now by sea. But it's a fraction of what's needed and the European Union accusing Israel of deliberately provoking famine. The starvation is used as a weapon of war. Israel denies that, saying it places no limits on food entering Gaza. Not far from Al Shifa, families fleeing the latest airstrike, salvaging what little they can from their homes. This little boy carrying a car seat. I swear to God, I'm afraid, he says. Now, Israel's ground assault on Rafah hasn't yet started, but we are seeing it intensifying its bombing in the south of Gaza. Prime Minister Netanyahu says if Israel does not destroy those Hamas units hiding in the south, it will lose this war. But he has also indicated he's prepared to at least delay an attack on Rafah if there's a breakthrough at those hostage negotiations underway mm. right now in Qatar. Savannah. All right, Ross Sanchez, thank you so much. Well, former President Trump is feeling the financial squeeze this morning. His lawyers say he has not been able to get a bond to secure that $464 million civil fraud judgment against him in New York. All of this comes as he faces growing backlash over comments he made over the weekend when he warned of a bloodbath for the country if he's not reelected. NBC News correspondent Garrett Haake has the latest here. 
A cash crunch for a self-proclaimed multi-billionaire. Former President Trump's lawyers saying Monday he doesn't have enough money on hand to pay the $464 million civil fraud judgment against him and can't secure a bond. Mr. Trump has until next Monday to post that bond or the New York Attorney General can seize his assets to satisfy the judgment, which he is appealing. In a statement overnight, Trump calling a bond of this size, quote, unprecedented and practically impossible for any company, including one as successful as mine. It comes as the former president is facing a growing backlash for his comments in Ohio, warning of a bloodbath for the country if he's not reelected during a riff about Chinese car makers. We're going to put a 100 percent tariff on every single car that comes across the line, and you're not going to be able to sell those cars if I get elected. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. Mr. Trump says he was talking about an economic bloodbath, accusing Democrats of pushing misinformation. I used it about trade, essentially auto trade, because we're getting ripped off with Biden's really dumb auto policy. The Biden campaign out with a new ad. And it's going to be a bloodbath for the country. Linking Mr. Trump's words to his past remarks about political violence, including the deadly 2017 white supremacist rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. Very fine people on both sides. The former president has recently ramped up talk of political violence. In January, warning what might happen if the criminal charges against him cause him to lose the 2024 election. It'll be bedlam in the country. It's a very bad thing. And Savannah, another day, another controversy for the former president. This, in a new interview last night, the former president said that, quote, any Jewish person who votes for Democrats hates their religion, and the Democrats, quote, hate everything about Israel. Those comments echo the anti-Semitic dual loyalty trope about American Jews and have already been widely condemned by Jewish lawmakers, including Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, who's the highest-ranking Jewish person ever in American government, who called those remarks part of a hateful rant. Savannah. All right, Garrett Haig, thank you very much. Well, now let's go to Capitol Hill, where lawmakers have reached a tentative deal to avoid a government shutdown, but the deal must be approved by both the House and the Senate, and the clock is still ticking toward Friday's deadline. For more, we are joined by NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles. He is in Washington. Of course, Ryan, take us through the details on this deal. Tell us how it came together. Well, this is a significant breakthrough, Savannah, because this uh, section of the government that still needed to be funded uh, represents almost three quarters of government funding in some of the most important departments. We're talking about the State Department, the Pentagon, and, of course, the Department of Homeland Security. And the hang-up was the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, there was some disagreements between the White House and congressional Republicans as to how the Department of Homeland Security should be funded going forward, especially because Republicans have been pushing for significant policy changes as it relates uh, to the migrant crisis. Uh, they seem to have worked out those issues. Uh, we'll learn more as to exactly what they've agreed upon when they release that bill text later today. Uh, and Savannah, they really needed to get it out by today if they want to meet that deadline on Friday, because it takes time uh, in the legislative process to get these bills through Congress. Uh, and the clock is ticking to get it done before Friday. Absolutely. So, Ryan, I mean, the big issue here had been money for the Department of Homeland Security. And the big issue with that was the overseas immigration enforcement. This has been the this huge wedge between parties, this huge wedge in Congress. Republicans recently killed this bipartisan border bill just last month. What are you hearing from leaders on both sides of the aisle on this potential deal and what was able to sort of be agreed upon finally? I, it seems as uh, though, Savannah, and we're not going to know definitively until the legislation comes out, but the read that we're getting is that they basically just agreed to not do all that much, that they, they were going to just continue uh, to fund the department at existing levels or maybe just a little bit more uh, to allow uh, for inflation and, and things along those lines. But there's not going to be any major wholesale policy changes that would specifically deal with the migrant crisis. That remains an impasse between congressional Republicans and the White House. Now, whether or not they'll revisit this. They still have that supplemental package uh, that also will allow for funding for Ukraine and uh, and for Israel and other things that could involve uh, more funding for the border. But at this point, DHS appears to just be holding steady uh, without any major changes. That's what it was going to take in order to get this bill over the finish line. That's not going to make congressional Republicans happy. And ultimately, what it's going to mean is that Mike Johnson is going to need Democrats to get this bill passed, which, as we know, that's what led to Kevin McCarthy the former House Speaker, being booted from office. At this point, conservatives don't feel compelled to do that quite yet, but we'll have to see what happens as this legislation makes, mm -hmm. it, makes its way through Congress over the next couple of days. All right, Ryan Nobles, thank you so much.
Well, we've got much more to come on this hour of Morning News Now, including President Biden's latest push to better fund women's health initiatives across the country. First, though, Cuba in crisis, rare protests in the nation's second largest city over deteriorating economic conditions. How the Cuban government is responding, that's up next. Welcome back. Cuba is in the middle of a deepening economic crisis with rare protests over dangerous shortages of food, medicine and fuel. Now the Cuban government is firing back. Here's NBC News reporter Ed Agustin in Havana with the latest. Tensions reaching a boiling point in Cuba. Hundreds of people participated in a rare public protest amid a worsening economic crisis that has left everyday Cubans without enough food, electricity or medication. Cuban-run TV showing people flooding the streets of the island's second largest city, Santiago de Cuba. Demonstrators seen chanting for electricity and food, as some Cubans have experienced power outages for more than 18 hours a day. I think there are three crises going on at the same time, an, an economic crisis, a social crisis, and now a political crisis. Um, the, the, of course, the most important and the, the most difficult to solve is the economic one. After the protest, Cuban President Miguel Diaz-Canel taking to social media saying, quote, mediocre politicians and terrorists on social media lined up from South Florida to fire up the streets of Cuba. The U.S. Embassy in Havana urging Cuba's government to respect the human rights of the protesters and address the legitimate needs of the Cuban people. In response to the embassy, Cuban's foreign ministry announcing it had summoned the top U.S. diplomat in Havana, accusing the embassy of interfering in the nation's internal affairs. The U.S. has sanctioned Cuba for more than 60 years, but in recent years they've been ratcheted up even more. President Biden has stuck with so-called maximum pressure sanctions that were imposed on this island during the Trump administration. Economists say they cost Cuba billions of dollars a year. Now, coupled with a moribund planned economy, they've created a cash crunch. Cubans struggle with increasing shortages in food, medicine, fuel and power. Inflation has risen sharply, making many products unaffordable for Cubans who depend on an average monthly state salary, the equivalent of just $16. Earlier this month, gasoline price hikes also went into effect. In some cases, raising gas prices about 500%. Esto que está haciendo el país. In another rare move, Cuba has asked the UN World Food Programme for assistance, requesting powdered milk for young children. All this while the Cuban peso has plummeted. Inflation has really gone crazy over the last couple of years, to the point where if your salary is entirely in Cuban pesos, its value has deteriorated about 90 percent compared to the U.S. dollar in just the last two years. Demand has spiked for the U.S. dollar, leaving Cubans with limited options to live out their daily lives. Drastic measures in the face of uncertainty. Younger Cubans have sort of lost hope in the possibility that it's going to get better anytime soon. Our thanks to Ed Agustin for that report. Well, coming up not so fast after the break, the popular diet trend that some new research is calling into question. The doctor is in up next. Welcome back. Let's get you some international headlines in the UK. A controversial plan to send asylum seekers on a one-way trip to Rwanda has cleared a major hurdle in Parliament. NBC News international correspondent Josh Letterman joins us on this. Hey, Josh, good morning. Hey, good morning, Savannah. Prime Minister Sunak's proposal to send those migrants to Rwanda is now one step closer to being adopted following that vote uh, in Parliament last night. Now, this plan to pay Rwanda to take in migrants who aren't even from there has been hugely controversial here in the UK, with human rights groups saying it isn't safe. Sunak says deportation is the only way to get unauthorized asylum seekers to stop arriving in the UK on small boats. Now, let's head to the UN, where there is a new push to make sure that outer space remains nuclear-free. 
the U.S. and Japan are sponsoring a Security Council resolution calling on countries not to send nuclear weapons into space. It comes after U.S. lawmakers last month disclosed intelligence suggesting Russia was developing a space-based anti-satellite weapon, although President Putin of Russia has disputed that. And finally, back here in London, the late singer Freddie Mercury's final home is now on sale for a reported $38 million. Fans of the film Bohemian Rhapsody may remember the eight-bedroom villa in the upper-class Kensington neighborhood. The Queen's frontman bought it in 1980, and he spent his final years there before dying in 1991. Savannah? All right, Josh, thank you so much. Well, this morning, there are new images of Princess Kate on a shopping trip with her husband, Prince William. It is the first video of the royal in months following her abdominal surgery, but it still leaves unanswered questions about her recovery. NBC News correspondent Molly Hunter is at Buckingham Palace with the latest for us. Hey, Molly, good morning. Savannah, lots of questions. And finally, what we've been waiting for is sort of some video of Kate, the Princess of Wales, out walking. She looks great. She looks healthy. She looks strong. But Kensington Palace wouldn't comment on the pictures or video. Take a look. Walking about at Windsor. The Princess of Wales seen on video. This morning, finally, video of Kate, the Princess of Wales, in public. The video, obtained by TMZ, published yesterday, reportedly shows Kate and husband Prince William walking out of a Windsor farm shop over the weekend. Dressed casually, the Prince of Wales sporting a baseball cap, the 42-year-old princess in workout clothes and running shoes. It may be that they realise that this is a helpful answer to a lot of the questions floating around. She's clearly on the road to recovery. The last time the public saw video of Kate was almost three months ago at Christmas. And concerns over her health have only grown as she stayed out of the public eye. Hospitalized for planned abdominal surgery, followed by a long recovery according to the palace. And now well-wishers and royal fans the world over, relieved to see her walking briskly, carrying shopping bags and smiling. The sun splashing on their front page this morning. Great to see you again, Kate. But as the video went viral on social media, public scrutiny on the palace remains high. And officials at Kensington Palace continue to insist her first official public appearance won't come until next month. I think that we're living in a, a very unique time where there is a demand for information and people share information more than they ever have done in the past. This is uncharted territory for the royal family in terms of the explosion of interest from social media. It's giving us reason to question things in a way that we haven't done before. It comes exactly a week after that photograph on Mother's Day and Kate's apology the morning after, blaming her editing. Despite questions, Kensington Palace offered no further explanation last week, even as the Prince of Wales participated in public events. But video showing Kate out and about looking energetic and happy alongside her husband should put to rest at least some, but not all, questions surrounding her health. Savannah, we are talking about perhaps the most recognizable woman right now in the world. So Kensington Palace has to assume that if Kate goes out into public, people will be there with their iPhones, snapping pictures, snapping video. And that means the speculation from all corners of the globe, from all corners of the Internet, will continue to fill that information void if Kensington Palace won't provide any additional information. Savannah? That's a good point. Molly Hunter, thank you so much. Well, longtime talk show host Oprah Winfrey is opening up about her battle with obesity in a new primetime special about weight loss. The hour-long program takes a look at how weight loss medications have been a game changer for people struggling with obesity for years. And during the special, Winfrey gets emotional when recalling the shame she felt trying to lose weight. NBC News correspondent Emily Akata joins us more no, joins us now with more. Hey, Emily, good morning. Savannah, good morning to you. The queen of daytime TV making her return in primetime, discussing the new weight loss revolution being spurred by popular weight loss drugs. Oprah sharing she, like millions of others, has been using the drugs to control her weight while also trying to remove the stigma surrounding them. Conversation for everybody. Overnight, Oprah Winfrey tackling a deeply personal topic for her and millions of Americans who struggle with weight loss. Because when I tell you how many times I have blamed myself in a one-hour special called Shame, Blame, and the Weight Loss Revolution, Oprah sharing how new weight loss medications have helped change her life. I still want the bagel. And, totally, totally. I just want less of the bagel. Less of the bagel. The 70-year-old talk show icon once suggested the drugs were not for her. I felt I've got to do this on my own. Mm. I've got to do this on my own because if I take the drug, that's the easy way out. 
But now, speaking out and seeming to credit her recent stunning weight loss to so-called GLP-1 drugs that include wildly popular medications like Ozempic, Wagovi, Manjaro, and Zepbound, which stimulate the body to produce more insulin and help curb hunger. A Cleveland Clinic doctor who also works with the drug companies explaining why they're so effective for those who haven't seen sustainable results from diet and exercise alone. People who are dieting are basically trying to restrict their caloric intake because that's what we've been told, almost trying to hold their breath underwater. Oprah has been open about her weight for decades. For 25 years, making fun of my weight was national sport. From talking candidly about her gains and losses. 67 pounds. To becoming a Weight Watchers ambassador and investor. I love bread. On the special, Oprah also exploring the stigma surrounding obesity, including with one woman who lost nearly 160 pounds with the help of medications. I am treated like a completely different human being. But the life-changing medications are not for everyone. I was just throwing up, and when I went to the ER, that was it. One study found 17% of Wagovi users stopped taking the drug because of potential side effects. But Oprah outlining a new perspective on her own journey that she's hoping to share with others. And for the people who think that this could be the relief and support and freedom, as you said earlier, that you've been looking for your whole life, bless you because there is space for all points of view. Oprah also explaining last night she recently broke ties with Weight Watchers because she wanted to do this special and did not want any conflicts of interest. It's certainly mm. part of an ongoing conversation. You think about it, more than 70 percent of adult Americans are overweight or obese. So a lot of eyes on this. Definitely. And these drugs are totally changing the game in so many ways. A lot to watch for. Emily, thank you so much. Thanks, Spana. Well, if you are on your own weight loss journey, you might have heard about intermittent fasting and how it could potentially help you achieve your goals. Well, if you haven't, here's how it works. It's a weight loss strategy where all the meals you eat during the day are within a shortened time frame and then they're followed by an extended period of fasting. New research, though, presented at an American Heart Association conference is challenging that theory and finding that intermittent fasting could potentially be leading to an increased risk of death from cardiovascular disease. That would contradict many studies on its health benefits and relative safety. Well, here with more is NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel. Dr. Patel, thanks as always for joining us. So look, this is a very popular method of weight loss and even just like not even necessarily weight loss, but just like of, of eating. Sometimes I do this if my day's so long, I get up so right. early, I still go to bed super late. You don't want to feel like you ate, you know, 16, 18 hours in the day. So you try to be focused. And as far as I know, it's judged to be pretty safe. I feel if anything, I've heard more like the effectiveness of it called into question rather than the safety of it. And I know you've got some stipulations around this research. You want to make sure we know. So give it to us. What do we need to know? Yeah, Savannah, and you're you're in great company because it's estimated that millions of Americans have been trying some form of this, maybe not as strict as the study defined, but this was a study looking at 20,000 adults, and it was over an average of about 8 to 17 years that they had self-reported data. So this is people like you and me just filling out kind of self-reported surveys at intermittent periods. And I think that's a caveat in and of itself. It's self-reported, number one. Number two, this wasn't peer-reviewed as a presentation, albeit an important one at the American Heart Association. The third caveat I would give you is it was based on self-reported kind of diet patterns for about two days. So, of course, people tried to write consistently what they were doing and that they were fasting over certain periods. But, Savannah, you and I both know that that can break down especially at critical times in your life. So this was meant to just be one of the first, and then here's the punchline, you alluded to the higher cardiovascular disease risk in patients who were fasting, and it was in that 16 hours of fasting, eight hours of eating window in general, they had a 91% relative risk of cardiovascular disease higher than compared to people who were not fasting. It doesn't tell us anything about what they ate either. So if you're eating junk food in that eight hours, even if you're restricting it to eight right. hours, that's not gonna help your body. So I think those are some of the big caveats. But as you pointed out, there's a lot of peer reviewed studies that point out to the positives of intermittent fasting, leaving a lot of people confused sometimes. Yeah, well, I think also, like, I mean, you know, our viewers just saw giant 91% on their screen here that, that increased. Yeah. And you think like, oh, hey, it seems, I mean, the reason why I have liked this in the past is because it's it can be an easier one, I think, to tackle than, than you know, some other right. diets, which is, you know, I mean, honestly, like, who sometimes you don't want to give certain things up or you don't want to go carb free right. or you don't want to do keto or whatever. And you're like, okay, this seems like something kind of manageable as long as, you know, you're within reason being healthy within the hours that you're eating. Right. But when you hear 91% of anything uh, becoming a risk, it sounds like a 
huge number. I mean, is this something that people should be concerned about or talking to a doctor about? Like, what's the takeaway? Look, I'm a big fan of talking to the experts. And in this case, it should be your doctor. But I would also put a plug in for nutritionists and dietitians. I don't think enough of us kind of talk about the value of sitting down with somebody who studies nutrition. I had about six weeks of nutrition training in medical school. I am not an expert, but I am an expert in cardiovascular disease. I am an expert in preventing disease. So what I think you need to do, what this tells me and what I've been doing myself and with other patients is that you need a personalized approach. If in doing that eight hours of eating, Savannah, you do what you did and what I usually try to do, which is I make sure I'm getting veggies, fruits, and protein. It's hard, but I try to make sure I do it. Then having that fasting period is incredibly helpful to do exactly what you said. It's almost like a mental reminder. Okay, this is when I should eat. All right, I probably shouldn't eat in this time window because we know that people gain weight when they're eating mindlessly. They're mm. not hungry. They're just eating. So I think you need a personalized approach, and it depends on your past, your genetics, and kind of who you are and what your goals are. And then I think the third thing is really thinking about what people are eating in that eight hour window. I want to stress this. They also found that in those 20,000 people, they had lower muscle mass when they compared them to the non-intermittent mm. fasters. Savannah, that's telling me they're not getting enough protein. And honestly, I'm going to do another plug, lift heavy stuff. Like when yeah. you're dieting, as that weight's coming off, as Oprah's taking off her weight with drugs, you need to lift and get that muscle mass because we're already losing it even without a diet. With a diet, the weight comes off in muscle too. I think all those things can give you a well-rounded exercise and diet regimen, and that will make you healthier. And don't kill yourself over doing something. I see too many people that kind of criticize themselves that they can't follow a certain diet. Mm. Everything that works for you is the diet that you should follow if yeah. it's following these kind of healthy guidelines. I'm just going to say it. Some of the some of what these people were up to during this study period, I'm not sure about if we're questioning protein, losing muscle mass. Right. So I think, you know, there's obviously a lot still to be right. said about benefits or maybe not so much harm as these headlines maybe make it seem about intermittent fasting. Dr. Kavita Patel, we always appreciate your context and your information you. and the conversation. Thanks for being here. Well, three women are opening up about a frightening attack by a cougar, leaving one with permanent damage to her face. NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz has this story. I know for a fact I would be dead if they didn't come back in. I, I would just be gone. It's an incredible story of survival and friendship. <laughs> They're amazing. These three women now sharing their near-death encounter with an aggressive baby cougar while bike riding outside Seattle. The attack just happened so fast. The competitive cyclists who have been riding together for five years say the terrifying ordeal happened in the blink of an eye. 19 miles into their ride, two cougars ran out from the brush. One went back into the woods, but the other lunged at this woman, Carrie Bergier, dragging her off her bike, its jaw clenched to her face. From the time we saw the cougars to the time it took carry off her bike was about three seconds. One second, I'll say. So we didn't have a chance to face off with them to scare them away or anything. I just remember getting tackled from this side and then ending up at the other side of the road. The friends immediately jumped into action for 15 minutes, facing off in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the wild cat. I immediately tried to choke the cougar, which was like choking a rock. I knew every second what was going on, and I was doing my own, you know, poking at it and trying to poke his eyeballs out and get up his nose and pry his mouth with my hand. Eventually, the cougar releasing, giving Carrie a moment to get away, as the other two women managed to get a bike on the cougar to hold it down until help arrived. You know, Carrie's just laying there by herself, and we just kept saying, are you doing OK? And she would just give us a little bloody thumbs up that she was doing OK. Fish and wildlife authorities who shot and killed the young cougar telling our NBC affiliate in Seattle that what happened here is very rare. In the last 100 years, there have been two deadly attacks and 20 that left someone hurt. These bicyclists just happen to be in that place, wrong place at the wrong time. They don't look for people to stay away from people. 99% of the time. Carrie spent five days in the hospital, treated for severe trauma to her face, including permanent nerve damage. While her recovery is far from over, she says she knows how lucky she is to be alive and to have friends willing to fight through their fears to save her. The epitome of true friendship and love is mm -hmm. action. We just did what we had it to do, and part of it was just primal instinct. Just get in there and fight. Mama bears. Fight for a life. <laughs> So. Yeah, the cougar wasn't going to take us cougars down. <laughs>
What a story. Our thanks to Liz Kreutz for that report. Coming up, taking action after the break. The Biden administration's latest push to expand women's health research in America. We'll dig into the new executive order just signed by the president up next. Welcome back. This morning, President Biden is taking action to expand women's health research across the country. The Biden administration signed an executive order yesterday announcing more than 20 new actions and commitments by federal agencies that address the initiative. It includes $200 million for research at the National Institutes of Health. The president spoke about the order during a Women's History Month event at the White House. I'm directing the most comprehensive set of executive actions ever taken to improve women's health ever taken. And I'm going to ensure that women's health is integrated and prioritized across the entire federal government. And I will spearhead new research and innovation for breakthroughs in a wide range of women's health needs and that they experience throughout your, you experience throughout your lives, because it really matters. The president and first lady first announced their push for women's health back in November. Since then, the Biden administration has repeatedly called on Congress to invest in what the president is calling a, quote, fund on women's health. NBC News White House reporter, White House correspondent, excuse me, Monica Alba joins us now for more. Monica, good to see you. So walk us through the specifics of this order. What efforts will be funded with this money? So this is really an area that is grossly underfunded, Savannah. And really, when you think about the amount of women in this country who suffer from certain medical issues ranging on everything from Alzheimer's to MS to other immunocompromised challenges, there simply isn't enough data or research or money the Biden administration is pointing out that goes into looking at why. And there have been studies from a couple of years ago that really show that women have been suffering from being over-medicated or having side effects from common drugs because the trials that took place only did dosage for men. So it's something like really just changing and altering the way that certain medical research is done, certain approaches to all of this. So the Biden administration is now putting a lot of money behind this effort with this executive order, but also just directing national resources to really focus on this idea and to look at why women haven't been given as much attention in this space and why they should be now. So First Lady Jill Biden's been spearheading the White House's push to boost this funding for women's health. What has that looked like and how successful has it been? And she has been traveling now over the last couple of months trying to raise this. And really, again, it is spans so many different areas. And this is something really where yesterday the first lady was saying that she's talked to so many women around the country who say they go to the doctor with certain symptoms and they're told, oh, you know, just ignore it, hang in there, and they're not believed. And this is something where really the first lady says that she has had such anecdotal experience hearing about this that she wanted to turn this into something more concrete. And so far she's been able to do that again with a lot of money and this major initiative, but they are pushing for more and they are asking for Congress to take it a step further, but they seem to be really indicating that this will be a priority. And then, of course, when we're talking about a possible re-election here, they're pledging to take this into a next term, too, if there is one. The president also took aim at Republicans during these comments that he made, warning women's rights would be on the ballot for the 2024 elections. Let's listen. Those bragging about overturning Roe v. Wade to support a national ban on abortion have no clue about the power of women. I mean it sincerely. But they're finding out. I mean, how much, Monica, does the Biden administration rely on the vote of women? Did they do so in 2024? Are they looking to do so this year? And, you know, how much of this is almost a campaign strategy to see women's issues kind of put front and center in the way that they are right now, right as we're heading into an election? Definitely. And women were critical to his victory last cycle. And so they are hoping and counting on that. And that is why they are making the issue of reproductive health care such an important one. When you look at the president's State of the Union after discussing some international crises and some other issues, the most prominent domestic major area that he discussed in that speech was the issue of abortion access. And that's something because Democrats have seen the momentum from the 2022 midterms and other special elections since then where really people are coming out and voting and they're motivated by this. So they think that's going to happen again in November. And that's why they're appealing to women on that front as well. All right, Monica Alba, thank you so much. Now let's get you financial headlines, starting with news out of Japan Central Bank. CNBC Silvana Hanau has that for us, as well as other money news. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Yeah, the Bank of Japan scrapping its radical policy, hiking interest rates for the first time in 17 years. Now, 
the shift making Japan the last global central bank to exit negative rates, which essentially meant the government was paying investors to buy its bonds in a years-long effort to boost the economy. However, the BOJ is still keeping rates stuck right around zero as it goes slow on further hikes in borrowing costs. Japan's stock market rising after the decision, while the yen fell against the U.S. dollar. Amazon is teaming up with one of the web's most popular video creators, Prime Video and MGM Studios, announcing a new reality competition series with Mr. Beast. Beast Games will feature 1,000 competitors vying for a $5 million cash prize. It will stream exclusively on Prime Video in more than 240 countries. Mr. Beast, whose real name is Jimmy Donaldson, will be the host and the executive producer. His YouTube channel has 245 million subscribers and his viral videos routinely rack up 100 million views. And TGI Fridays is giving college basketball fans a consolation prize if their March Madness brackets get busted. Free wings. The chain will give away free wings to every fan with a busted bracket through April 8th. It's also offering 50 cent wings on game days for the men's and women's tournaments at participating locations. Customers can also take part in $5 happy hour from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. to closing Monday through Friday, Savannah. There you go. I like it. All right, Savannah, thank you so much. <laughs> you got it. Well, with the total solar eclipse less than three weeks away, the Texas Hill Country region is becoming one of the most popular destinations for watching. While some counties there have issued a disaster declaration even in anticipation of the record-breaking crowds, the city of Bernie says they don't want to dim the excitement. Reporter Alicia Barrera from our Dallas-Fort Worth affiliate KXAS has more. Welcome to Bernie, Texas, population 22,000. It's still just got the small town charm that I love and the people are really kind. The colorful storefronts and historic buildings preserve its beauty and for many serve as a retreat from the city. We're less than two hours from Austin. We're 30 minutes from San Antonio. Today's talk of the town, Bernie's three minute, 23 second solar eclipse totality on April 8th. So I've been waiting for this for years, so it's amazing. And how could you miss that? It's gonna be like a cosmic event. How could you possibly miss it here? The cosmic event, even making wedding bells ring. Uh, there's a couple who was coming into town from out of state and they wanted to be married during the total eclipse. And while no city sponsored event is planned, Bernie's director of communications, Chris Shadrock says, they've been working behind the scenes with authorities, businesses, and its chamber of commerce. They have extra food that day. They've got extra cash that day. All of those things to be prepared for an influx of visitors and customers. If it's anything like our big events that we have, it's going to be crazy. Lacey Rutzolf owns two boutiques in town, and she's helping plan a solar eclipse theme market that will not only help boost local economy, but allow visitors to take a piece of Bernie history back home. It's a great opportunity for all the businesses here because we're going to have lots of people. We've had people calling from like all over the United States saying they're coming to Bernie to see it. So we're very excited. So cool. Our thanks to Alicia Barrera for that report. Well, coming up, pulling on the heartstrings after the break, we'll introduce you to a Kentucky high schooler who's taking that promposal rite of passage to a whole new level. Look at this. That is up next. Stay with us. Welcome back. Something went bump, and that bump made them jump. And who stepped on the mat? None other than Cat in the Hat. I'm rhyming. I'm reading Dr. Seuss because Warner Brothers has just announced that Bill Hader is going to have to start practicing his meow. The SNL alum will voice the title role in the upcoming film adaptation of The Cat in the Hat. He will be joined by Quinta Brunson, Sochi Gomez, and Bowen Yang. The movie will also mark the Chaotic Kitty's animated big screen debut. But hold your pause. <laughs> you have a little time to get your rhymes ready. The movie is expected to hit theaters in March 2026. I feel like Bill Hader is a fantastic cat in the hat. That's cool. Finally, this hour, prom season is fast approaching, which means nervous high schoolers are preparing their promposals. That is where they ask their classmates to the dance. Well, for one Kentucky student, that meant taking things up a notch by cranking up his tractor. Reporter Alina Noakes from our NBC News affiliate in Louisville has the story. Move over flowers and poster board signs, Brett Leiter is taking promposals to new links in a way that's much more his style. Yeah, I just went out there and I done what I done best. I'm probably better 
pl uh, plowing a field than I am writing on a poster with a marker. That couldn't be more true for the 17-year-old farmer, who is also ranked the number one tractor driver in the state of Kentucky. But that doesn't make asking a girl out on a date, much less to your first prom, any less intimidating. My anxiety was through the roof on when I was doing it, if she was going to look good or she was even going to say yes. But that didn't stop lighter. He cranked up his grandpa's Alice Chalmers tractor, hooked up the till, and drove just over the hill to his grandpa's field, ready to make quick work of his big idea. Right there on the hood, it says land handler, and I can tell you what, it does handle some land. It'll get, it'll, it'll roll on, I tell you. It took him about 40 minutes to spell out the letters P-R-O-M. Luckily for Lighter, it took his date, Madeline Smith, a little less time to say yes. I did not expect all that. I was expecting maybe a little poster, but when I seen that, I was like, I almost cried. If she would have said no, I would have been out there plowing till midnight to get it covered up. The promposal that can only be seen from a bird's eye view has captured the attention of thousands online, garnering more than 10,000 shares on TikTok in a matter of hours and hundreds more on social media in his hometown. It was super sweet, genuine, so I felt like everyone should see it and, you know, get a little happiness out of it. And best of all, the video has helped to bring a little positivity to residents in Milton still reeling from the tornado that ripped through the city just a few days before. I just thought that it would really help the people that are suffering from this, like help uplift their mood right now and maybe put a grin on their face. Our thanks to Alita Noakes for that report. How cool is that? Well, that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Thanks for hanging around this morning. Stay with us, though. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.